Sheila Labar thought of herself as an angel sent to the world in order to rid this world of all predators. After she had relations with a new man in her life, she always made sure to tell them they had just made love to an angel, when in actuality they had just encountered a demon. As a little girl, she had been a victim of her father and all the men that he had allowed to victimize her too. This would cause her to hate all men. This true crime case involves incest, SA, and BDSM, so viewer discretion is advised. Hello, my name is Holly. Welcome to the Murder She Shed. This is the place where we honor the dead right from my little she shed. Step inside my world for just a few minutes. Get comfy and let me tell you a story. But first, just make sure you smash that subscribe button so you can visit me right here in the she shed again. And actually, every week. Epping, New Hampshire is a small town where everyone knows the story of Sheila Labar in the 115-acre ranch on 70 Red Oak Lane where she resided. This ranch would never be the same after human remains were found in a burn pile on the land. Police were investigating a missing persons report when they encountered the burn pile full of bones with some meat still attached. Sheila's story can only be told if we begin at her childhood. Sheila was the youngest child of a family with six children. Sheila was first essayed by her father when she was only four months old. As she lay in between her mom and dad, the people that she should have been able to trust the most, her dad would essay her just when she was a tiny baby. Her sister actually confessed that she seen this happen, so she knew it was true. Not only that, but the dad allowed other men to come in and essay this little girl. When she was only two years old, a friend of her dad's was sitting on the couch when he stuck his hands up her dress and essayed her right in front of her dad. As a teenager, Sheila dreamed of being a model or country music singer and getting out of her of home where her dad was a violent drunk and predator. When she was young, she had a car accident where she slid into a coma for several days. And according to her, she had died and found herself seated at a table with various men with long beards. She insisted that one of the men was God and that he told her that her work on earth was not complete. So she had to go back, return to earth as an avenging angel under orders to kill predators and perverts like the men who had hurt her when she was little. Then in 1997, Sheila answered a personal ad placed by 61-year-old widower Wilford Beale Labar. Sheila, who was just in her late 20s at the time, put her southern charm to good use on Beale, who was a chiropractor from Epping, New Hampshire, and she quickly moved in with him at his ranch. Bill became like a father figure and lover to her. Bill had been lonely after losing his wife and fell deeply in love with Sheila. Bill's farm was basically a horse farm that was located down a country road and was very remote and secluded from other homes. Sheila liked being dominant of her partners when it came to this side of her relationships with men. She eventually started using her dominance in other aspects of Bill's life. She began to control the farm and Bill's chiropractor business. When she would show up at Bill's office, she would always wear seductive clothing. She knew how to charm and seduce men and was known as an easy lay around town. She soon began to isolate Bill from his family, and even though they were not married, she claimed to be his common law wife and took his last name. She was even able to convince Bill to sign power of attorney over to her. Then something even more bizarre happened. She was able to convince Bill that she needed a young lover to move into the ranch with them since Bill just couldn't keep up with her libido. This is when she moved in a Jamaican immigrant named Wayne Ennis. She even married Wayne after he moved in. But Sheila had a disturbing sign to her in which her personality could change at a drop of the hat. One night, Sheila told Wayne she wished a horse would kick Bill in the head and kill him, that she had thought of strangling him herself, and that she wanted Wayne to kill him. She also began to hit, shove, and fire at Wayne. One time, she pointed a gun at him and said she would send him back to Jamaica in a box. 
Needless to say, their marriage only lasted about 16 months before he hightailed it out of there. I don't blame him. He was a smart guy to get out of there when he did, or he had probably ended up dead too. Then in December of 2020, Bill died at the age of 74, supposedly because of a massive heart attack. Although Bill's grown children thought his death involved a little help from Sheila, that was never proven. She was able to get all of Bill's assets, including the 115-acre ranch. After Bill passed away, the horse farm became to look more like a rabbit farm. Sheila had an obsession for rabbits. They were running everywhere, including running around inside the farmhouse. They were running and pooping and doing whatever, wherever they wanted to. For some reason, I don't know if it involved something to do with their childhood, but she had this freakish deal with the rabbits. She loved them in weird ways. Too many weird ways for me. Soon after Bill had died, Sheila went shopping for a new man at the local homeless shelter. She needed companionship because she was scared to stay in that farmhouse by herself. She said it was haunted. She preferred men that had mental challenges and no assets of their own so she can control them physically, mentally, every way. She wanted to be in control. At the homeless shelter in 2003, she met a man named Michael Deluge, or Mikey as he preferred to be called. She liked to tie her men up in bed and have them confess their secret desires. Only she forced them to say things that were completely untrue. Basically, her fantasies. She forced them to confess. She would make them tell her that they liked being with little girls. So Mikey was forced to say, I like little girls. I've been with little girls. I've been with my relatives. This kind of thing really turned Sheila on. Basically, even though the guys hadn't done any of this, she wanted to hear that they had, and she would whip them with a belt until they confessed to doing all this. She even made Mikey confess that he had tortured her rabbits by assaying them. She was a sick son of a gun. The idea of her lovers being predators just completely aroused her. She would quote Bible scriptures as she abused them, and she would record the whole conversation so she could later use it against him. She also made Mikey call his family and confess to what he had done to a family member, which they knew was not true. So they were completely confused why he would even be saying something like that. One day, someone had seen Mikey walking in the road a little ways from the farm. His face was cut and he was dripping blood and he told the neighbor that Sheila had attacked him. Mikey was able to get away from Sheila just for a couple of weeks but she tracked him down and brought him straight back to the farm. Not long after this, Mikey was never seen again. Sheila was a routine visitor of Telemates, a telephone dating service where callers would create a voicemail describing themselves. Hopeful strangers could leave messages. Usually, it was a chat, a social chat, where they discussed what they liked, what they were into, and she always said she was into the little BDSM. She liked to bead and bind. I'd say more like victims than lovers because most of them were victims. She was into the wild bondage type stuff. This is Sam. She's 27. She's an office manager. She's having a hard time managing her love life, though. Six months ago, she ended a five-year relationship. Right now, she's just looking to relax and have some fun. No strings attached. She didn't realize how hard it would be to get back into the game and find someone normal to hang with. Then a friend at work told her about telepersonals. She figured she had nothing to lose, so she called. Today, she's talking to Jeff. He's 33, in the same boat as her, and extremely funny. He knows how to let loose and have a good time, with no expectations. He also happens to have a best friend who's a fireman. Things could get interesting. Suddenly, the single life's not so bad, thanks to telepersonals. Phone telepersonals now. It's a free call. I mean, if you're into it, you're into it. That's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But, you know, she went a little far. Just a little far on hers. Sheila received numerous messages from assertive and persistent men who desired her. But she ignored those messages and waited for the lonesome and desperate. Long nights were spent engaging in phone 
with hopeful strangers. And one of those men was 24-year-old Kenneth Kunti. Kenny, as he was called by family, had the mental capacity of a 12-year-old. Kenny was an athletic kid who loved to play baseball. He had a way of making you laugh when you were down. He loved to watch old army and western movies, and his goal was to join the army one day. Although he attempted, he didn't make it past basic training. After returning back home, Kenny became depressed and lonely. And this is when he saw the ad on TV for Telemates and decided to give it a try. Kenny and Sheila planned to meet on February 14, 2006, Valentine's Day. Their first date would be at the Ashworth by the Sea Hotel in Hampton, a small and charming hotel that overlooks the beach. They instantly hit off with the kinkiness because as soon as they left for meeting, they went straight to her car and had wild, passionate relations, let's say that. It got hot and heavy fast. Sheila had such a great time that they met up four days later. And Sheila just took Kenny straight home to her ranch. And he would never leave this ranch again. So his family was very worried about Kenny. They knew this was not like him. Not to come home. Not to call. He could not function on his own. When Kenny's mother called the ranch, Sheila answered and said, Leave us alone. Kenny doesn't want to leave and slammed the phone down on Kenny's mother. Kenny's mom called the sheriff's office and asked if they could do a welfare check on Kenny. They always went in pairs to Sheila's farm because if they went alone, Sheila would often answer the door naked as a jaybird. She would also try to attempt to show them photos of how limber she was in bed. She liked to brag about her positions she could accomplish and what she could do for these officers. She was easy, as the town said. Very easy woman to get to know. Let's put it that way. When she answered the door, she informed them that Kenny was not missing. He was inside her house taking a shower. They asked to see him. She finally allowed them to, and Kenny, in a quiet voice, said he was fine. The next time Kenny was seen was in Walmart being pushed by Sheila in a wheelchair. Employees said he had cuts on his face and burns on his body that had turned a greenish yellow and looked infected. They were draining. He appeared as if he might faint, so authorities were called. Kenny refused any assistance and an incident report was rolled up. Kenny's family began receiving the same kind of messages that Mikey's family had received. Weird calls from Kenny where he is saying he essayed his niece, step-siblings, and other young relatives. Even his mom. He was saying that he was essayed by his mom. And his mom, no, oh no, that's not true. None of that was true. It was all lies and they were so confused. They didn't understand why Kenny would be saying this. And even the weirder part was Kenny's family heard guttural coughing and gagging while he was talking to them. It was just completely weird. That evening, Kenny's family insisted cops be sent back out to that farm. They arrived to find the gate closed. The sun had already set, and the lights were off in the quiet farmhouse. The detectives spotted a burnt mattress, and they could smell an awful smell. It was a burn pile in Sheila's front yard. In the burn pile was some rather odd items. A wooden chair faced the burn pits. A cop shined his flashlight over the burn pile. There resting in the pile was a knife handle with a melted blade. Tree limb clippers, a burnt chair, but most chilling of all, a piece of bone covered in flesh. When they informed Sheila of the bones they had found, she stated it was from a rabbit. They informed her the bone was too big for a rabbit, to which she said, it is either a rabbit or a they stared at her in shock and asked if they could take some items with them, to which she said they would need a search warrant. And then she was left alone to dispose of all that evidence that night. They got the search warrant, come back that morning to the farm. Authorities would say there was something extra creepy about the house. It was dark when they entered and it had the smell of death in the air. Specks of blood was seen on the kitchen cabinets and also in the living room floor where the now burnt mattress had once been. When they entered the laundry room in the washing machine was a comforter that smelled like vomit and decay. In the upstairs bathroom, blood cast off was located from the floor to the ceiling. It was like he had been chased with an axe or something, they would say. There was cast off all through the house they eventually found. 
The larger bones they had saw in the fire the night before was now gone, but they were still able to find small fragments in a set of human toes. In the sewer system, they found Mikey's driver's license. That made them realize they could be dealing with a serial killer. The set of toes did not belong to either Mikey or Kenny, so they believed there could be a third victim. Sheila had not only tortured her victims, but also the rabbits she had claimed to love. Don't even want to know what she did to the rabbits, considering what she would say about the rabbits. I'm out on that one. While they were finding all the evidence on the ranch, Sheila had went on the run. She changed her name to Casey, was able to hide out with a man she met in Boston at a hotel. On the third evening, he actually saw Sheila's face on the news and found out authorities were looking for her. So wisely, he decided to turn her butt in. She was arrested and during interrogation wanted to dominate the whole conversation. She attempted to turn the tables with the cops who interviewed her and they knew instantly they were dealing with a very controlling and manipulative person. She would get really close to them, almost so close they were touching, and it just sort of creeped them out. She was just flirty and manipulative and just seemed overall evil to them. After a seven-hour interview, she finally admitted to killing Mikey and Kenny, but stated that she was insane during the time of their murders. There was DNA found that was not from either victim she had admitted to, plus the toes, so it is thought she was a serial killer. At this time, they have not connected the DNA to her other victims. So, she has killed more than two, but they don't know who the other victims are. Scary. Very scary. But she met a lot of men through that Telemates chat line, who uh, she actually met and eventually murdered. Ultimately, she was declared sane to stand trial and was convicted of two first-degree murders with life in prison. With the crack of the judge's gavel, the avenging angel was sentenced to a life in hell. Welcome to hell, you awful, insane angel. Thank you for joining me at the Murder She Shed. Hope you come visit me next time. Make sure you hit that subscribe. I do not have Simon out here today because, well... <laughs> Our builder was out there, and he's scared of Simon. Can you imagine that? So I had to leave him in the house. I couldn't walk him outside because our builder freaks out when he sees him. Like Simon's ever hurt anybody. If you don't know, we're building a house. Our house blew away in a tornado, so we're having to rebuild a new house. But it's coming along. We are going to pour the foundation Friday. So we're getting there. By the time I probably put this video out, we'll be pouring the foundation. So I'm excited about that. And then next week we'll do the framing. The walls, putting the walls up is the best part. I'm ready to do that. There he is. Here's a baby boy. <laughs> what you doing, baby boy? He says, bye, but his daddy has the four-wheeler out. So he's more interested in what his daddy's doing with the four-wheeler. He's probably going to run off again. See? He thinks daddy's going to do something. Actually, Daddy's just fixing the axle on the four-wheeler, but... You're not telling him bye. You're just being rude right now. Say bye. Say we love you. And my mind is on a four-wheeler right now. Um, that's all I can think about. So anyway, we love y'all. <laughs> yes, we do. We love them, don't we? Have a great day. Bye. For a new man at the local homeless shelter. Good place to pick one up, I guess. And one of those men was 24-year-old Count it. Nothing wrong with a little tie up and a little kinky and a little choking, but hey, pulling the little hair never hurt, but don't go too far. Then it gets crazy. You become batshit crazy then. That's a little much. Keep it, keep it a little down from crazy. That's always good. Sheila Labar. One crazy, yeah, I'll just say chick. That's not what I wanted to use, but that's what I'm going to say. When we were on vacation riding our Harleys in Colorado, we were riding through this town, and these young boys, saying young because they were the age of my boys, and my boys in their 20s, to me that's young, considering I'm 50, that seems young. Anyway, we were riding through town, and these boys were like, Hey, let me ride on your Harley. And they were like, one of my Harley with me. My husband's just cracking up. 
Uh, he thinks it's the funniest thing. He loves it, I guess. I don't know. I don't know why he loved it, but he just thought it was so funny. And I'm like, since when did I become a freaking cooker? I don't know. Between the, I don't know if you remember my, I need more ice joke. And the guy thought I said I need more ass, and he was the same age as these boys on vacation. I just, for some reason on vacation, I was a cooker. I don't know how that happened, but I definitely wasn't as cookerish as Sheila Labar. I hope. I didn't look that cookerish, you know. Must have been looking good that day or something. My wrinkles were sunk in, not showing. I don't know. I must have. They just wanted a Harley mom, I guess. I don't know.